you know, we really want this to be a conversation. And so I'm going to open it now. Like you can unmute yourself and um, ask a question to the panelists or, or to me. And we do have some questions in the chat, but um, I want to like make sure that we have this be interactive. So um, does anyone have any questions right now? In Nevada, I think um, Karen Furlock had put some questions in. I think she's having a hard time getting her um, her. Uh, I think I have. It. I've got oh, it. Oh, good. Go ahead, uh, Karen. I'm very new to this group. In fact, I just met Nevada online. And when you were talking about women running for office, my the first time I had a conversation with her was. Would you please run for Congress against Pete Stauber? <laughs> and, uh, and she said, no, not right now. Uh, but um, my experience, and I'm new to this group, is um, the Minnesota Parent Teacher Association. Um, I'm an old time board member. And um, I testified many, many times um, at the state for public education. And I understand your fight because believe me, it is a fight down there, especially when you're a volunteer and not a paid lobbyist. Um, one of my questions is, um, it has to do with, I testified, one, one of my test, testimonies was in front of the Senate Finance Committee concerning um, opportunities being equal for all children in this state. And when I say opportunities, I'm not only talking about classroom, I'm talking about the enrichment opportunities. And what we discovered is, and it's pretty obvious when you think about it, um, parent groups meaning well have created a disparity in this state and within school districts. The district I was from, I live up here, by the way, in the North Country now. I live in an unorganized township. My mailing address is Big Fork, but I don't live there. Um, I live in the woods and uh, moved up here 14 years ago from the cities. My husband is a lifetime teacher. And, um, but one thing we found, I can't, he taught in a huge school district and within our school district, there were different economic opportunities. One was a very poor area. One was a very well-to-do area. The parents in the well-to-do area raised tons of money to enrich and enhance their children's education in that school. The one in the, with the poorer parents on the other side of the track, so to speak, couldn't raise as much money and therefore their enrichment and their opportunities were less. So within the same school district, there were unequal opportunities. And so my question about the page amendment, and I read through it, trying to follow it, but how do you plan on equalizing what parents give to school districts? Up here, I see that it, you know, I, my eyes have been open since I moved up here, quite honestly, in many ways. But um, up here, children don't have the opportunity you know, we send them out to be little salesmen to buy their stuff. And this is why I, I actually advocated many years ago for parents in the state to go on strike and never raise another dime for their schools so that the, the legislature could see how much they're taking away from us by making us raise money individually. Um, that probably didn't make any sense, but they keep cutting funding and we keep trying to raise funding and it creates a very unequal base for everybody. So to the page amendment, I say, how do you control what parent groups continue or contribute? Well, first of all, I wanna say, we are going to find a woman to run in CD8 <laughs> <laughs> and we are all going to support her hopefully, right? And right, uh, we're working on it. <laughs> yeah, we're like trying to break through that. Like it's, we've never had a woman um, a congresswoman in our in the CDA district, um, and I appreciate your work on reaching out to women and and encouraging them to run for office. I appreciate the fact that you reached out to me. Um, secondly, what I want to say about the page amendment is that we don't really take the scarcity mindset. Like we really think about 
the way of um, imagining public education with abundance, right? So we would never, ever, ever tell parents or community members that they shouldn't be raising resources into their community for their students. And, and you're right, there is like the ability to raise resources is different based on um, the economics of, the, of, of that school district. What we are saying is that we really want to see um, the state of Minnesota make it a paramount duty of the state, that there would be no higher duty than um, quality of public education. There might be things that are equal to it, but there couldn't be something that's higher to it, higher than it. And in that, we would see the legislature, the administration, and the courts all engage around ensuring that we have quality public education. And so what we know from other states and research is that what we see is that um, resources go into school districts and resources go into areas where we see disparity. And this is not like, I feel like there is a time in the past where it's like, well, let's measure and see how achievement is happening and then punish school districts for not meeting those standards, right? Like this is really more about like understanding. I mean, it, and I, I'm just gonna say it to you, like every single county in the state, 87 counties across Minnesota have educational disparities. This is not something that is like Missy was talking about. It's not a rural and urban issue. It is not like us versus them. Like it is not like that's not my that's not my county or that's not my area. It is literally across the board that we are seeing these disparities. And I I'll ask Liz to put in the chat the Fed tool around um, being able to look up your own school district to see what kinds of disparities exist um, in your own school district. But um, what we're really talking about really doesn't like we're not trying to again be craps in a bucket and say like you don't get to like share your resources with your students it's more about how does the state take on accountability and have accountability um, to our students and those who are most impacted by the disparities and so um, yeah I mean we're we're really making sure that there is accountability in the system which isn't there right now and does we that have, include, does that include, excuse me, does that include um, uh, petitioning the legislature to release more funds? Because that's been a huge, huge issue. They keep cutting, cutting, cutting. And yet we have this surplus every year, but education keeps getting more cuts. And they did it again this year, I found out, which I, I can't believe it. They gave some money because of COVID, but then they like up in Big Fork, um, our kindergarten teacher always had an aide, and it is recommended by the state that any classroom with over 25 kids and K to three, I believe it states, um, has to have an aide. Her aide was cut because of a cut in funding. And so once again, she deals with a lot of children that need extra help. You know, the disparity you're talking about. Um, we are a poverty area and her aid was cut. So it's those kinds of things that I think this speaks to, but has to be followed up with the legislature. Yeah, I mean, I just wanna say like that currently our system, what it requires is that we have an adequate system of public education. That is the standard adequate. It does not actually focus on children, it focuses on the system. And that is why our public education system right now is so like, just messed up. Like the page amendment, what we're doing is we're actually raising the standard to a quality standard from adequate to quality. And we're also focusing on children. So we're like really thinking not about whether the system is adequate or not. It's more about like our children receiving a quality education or not. It like creates a civil right for children to receive that education. And in Minnesota, I mean, most people in Minnesota, I mean, I'll, I'll admit to this as well. Like I grew up on the Iron Range. I grew up um, understanding this idea of high quality public education. I went to Hibbing High School. My dad went to Hibbing High School, right? Like it's sort of the Cadillac of public schools in the state or it was at a time. And I think that like um, what we're doing is really trying to like make sure that we are, we have that standard, but like that, that of course has like diminished over time. And we're still meeting the standard, like what, with these disparities, we're meeting our constitutional standard. So the point of the Page Amendment really is to like raise that standard, make sure that we have an, a framework that actually meets our values as Minnesotans, because 
I think everyone on this call understands that like our value is that our, our children and our people are educated and that we should have access. We should absolutely have access to high quality public education, right? And, um, and so that's what we're trying to do is, is make sure that it's reflected in the constitution. And I want to, because I know we're gonna run out of time. Um, I see Kathy, Tom, Linda Larson and Samantha Nelson have their hands up. So um, let's start with Kathy real quick and before we close out the call. Uh, I, I have one quick question. Um, let me put something in the chat here. Um, the Minnesota Constitution has two parts to its education clause, and we've seen the first one. Um, this is the second one. Um, is that going to be left alone and kept in? I hope so, because that's one of our main defenses against vouchers. Thank you <laughs> for bringing that up. I fought against vouchers for four years at the Capitol. Well, then you must know Roger Chamberlain very well. Well, um, yes. <laughs> and, and Senator Han, who is now head of the Republican Party, who was my um, shadow. Um, <laughs> but um, vouchers is a is something that I, at, no, uh, you don't all know. I'm, I'm a lifetime member of National PTA. I was granted an award uh, for my advocacy work. But um, the voucher subject came up with uh, pretty intensely with No Child Left Behind. And our national lawyer, talk about quality education, um, she explained to us what it was really all about. And it was about vouchers to close down public schools. That was the whole plan. And that yeah, is the well, plan. Right. Now they're doing yeah. workarounds that are not just that are not just vouchers. Yes. They're talking ESAs, about vouchers um, through middleman. Yes. Can I just right. answer the question? Profits and stuff, but that's a different that's a different topic. Yeah. I mean, all these workarounds yeah. will have to. We, I'm going to the question so that we can like move on to the yeah. next question. So the answer yeah. is like we don't have we're not adjusting that language. That is not a part of the page. Okay. And good. So I'm going to move also on. Wanted, to, um, Linda Larson has her hand up, and she's okay. been with me. Well, thank you. Uh, my question is brief. <clears throat> I want to know, uh, I'm, I'm going to reach out to uh, my legislators and uh, people in the networks that I'm affiliated with, and I'd like to know who would I um, identify as the contact information, uh, contact person, excuse me, to uh, advance this so that we can garner more support for you. Liz Johnson will send you information um, as a follow-up from this to like really get you connected into okay. any, any of those questions, but thank you. Yes, like we, we have a number of action items and tools that we're using to reach out to legislators and, and help folks um, um, engage in this. Thank you. So, um, Samantha, like I wanna make sure we get your question in before we close out. We Thank you. I'm not Samantha Nelson. I'm Sherry Bradaria. So I'm a superintendent in rural Minnesota. I don't know how many other um, administrators, public school administrators are on this group. But one of the things that I think is really important for all of you to know is that the group in Minnesota that most directly supports the work we do in schools on an hourly, daily, weekly, monthly basis is not in favor of the page amendment. And they're not in favor of the page amendment for this reason. And, and you're done at 9.30 and I got to run at 9.30, but here's what they I got from them yesterday. MASA asserts the proposed amendment as written has answered questions, is silent on how Minnesota's public education system would be funded, who determines uniform achievement standards and who is ultimately responsible for meeting these standards. The proposed amend, uh, supporters of the proposed amendment, the language uh, uh, fails to include full funding for public schools, strengthening current language in Minnesota constitution to close achievement gaps and ensure equity, quality education for every child. I have intentionally sought out information. I've watched uh, Cash Kari and Paige talk on many different occasions. Paige has even come to the Minnesota School Boards Association and spoke. 
but I have heard nothing as a public school administrator in, in rural West Central Minnesota, very, very little except what I've sought out. Um, I also want to say that there are about 11 to 13% of the administrators, superintendents in Minnesota who are women doing fantastic work, doing fantastic work it, as a passion of ours to provide equity, to spend money correctly, to make sure that our people are powerhouse. I also have to say, as, as this as the Page Amendment Group reached out to college to educate teachers, to educate administrators on what this all means, we get who the colleges it's great, send it's us. Great, yeah, it's a great question. I wanna answer it before we close out. Absolutely. We are talking with educators across Minnesota. We actually are talking with the group that um, MASA, MBS, MSBA, like there's a number of education groups that we are engaging with. And in terms of the, the position that they have taken is, you said it correctly, as written, right? And so we have not been able to make amendments to our language. Um, you can't do that until session opens. But what I can say is that we are working actively with our chief authors on addressing the issues that we're hearing from community members across the state of Minnesota. So that includes those education groups, but it also in includes like individuals like everyone on this call that we are re like really listening, taking that information in and making sure that we have the strongest language for our education amendment um, as we are working to get it on the ballot. So I, I totally hear what you're saying. And I want you to know that we as a campaign are being extremely responsive to that. You're not probably gonna hear Paige and Kashkari talk about it because they are really talking more about the research and the information around public education disparities where the campaign, we are the ones who are doing the work. Um, we are a 501c4, we have the ability to go in and talk with legislators and to work out the details of this. And so we fully expect that all of those education groups are gonna come on board with the Page Amendment as we introduce um, some language changes. Reach, reach out to school administrators. Yep, we've thank been talking you. with them. Yes, thank you. Um, and so we have a minute left. I wanna kick it to Liz real quick to talk about action items. Um, and then I think we're gonna close. Okay, the first thing you can do just right now is take out your phone and dial the number 50457 and text 504. Five, seven, text the word page and you will be enter, you'll be kept abreast of everything we're doing um, on the weekly as we're gearing up for session right now. We've got a couple of events coming up on the horizon. We'd love to see you at them. Um, we'll follow up with an email, but just very quickly, we're going to do a virtual advocacy training on how to advocate during uh, COVID uh, for your, uh, your support of the Page Amendment. Um, we're going to be doing a week of action when the legislature opens. We're asking folks to start the week off by attending their precinct caucus and proposing a resolution in support of the Page Amendment at your precinct caucus. We'll, we, have a draft, we have a draft you can use and circulate to your friends and neighbors um, so that they also take it to their precinct caucuses. Um, then we'll do a press briefing from the Capitol. We have to keep it small because of COVID in a small space, but we'll be live streaming that. We'll also be live streaming uh, on uh, Wednesday the 2nd, uh, Youth Voices panel with youth from, um, from Rochester and the Twin Cities who are gonna speak to the Page Amendment and why they wanna see it passed. And then we're gonna have a page, some of our partner organizations and partners closest sort of education kind of uh, guru folks. Uh, we're gonna do a live stream panel the following day of week of action with them. And just really creating momentum because we know that when we do extensive polling, 80 to 85% of Minnesotans want to create literally a civil right 
for children to have access to a quality education. And so in other states, that would be enough to just do a petition and get it on the ballot. We'd be done, but we have to get those legislators to place it on the ballot. And what a great time to put it on the ballot because everybody in every district has consequential elections this coming November. And so we would have the most voices weighing in at the most active time um, and really let the voters decide the, ultimately um, to pass the Page Amendment. So anyway, um, I'm just so um, thrilled to see so many familiar faces here today. And uh, if you have any questions and you wanna get involved, like I said, do the text because that gets you into the email and you'll, you'll hear updates and information. Uh, and just email me or call me directly and um, we can conspire to do uh, a, a meeting like this with other groups uh, that you're, you're involved with. Well, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Nevada. <laughs> thanks, Liz, for wrapping us up here. And thanks, Beth and Missy, for your presentations. As always, these webinars are just amazing for us to be able to host. Incredible women doing incredible work and raising big issues that we all need to learn more about and figure out how we can better support each other. So we will do a follow-up um, email that has all the resources, everything that was in the chat. Um, we'll link to the website and we will have a recording, a video recording of this meeting. So you will get that um, later today or first thing tomorrow morning, depending on how our video editing goes. But um, I wanna thank everybody. We've got a lot of information to share about 100 Row Women and we have upcoming events, but we will share that. I know we're running over time, about four minutes, but this was such a critical and important topic for all of us to talk about and learn more. So thanks everyone. Hope you have a great day and hopefully see you next month at our webinar. Thanks.